welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Maria Salvador, your moderator for today's program. We've just been welcomed by a traditional Abenaki song played by our special guest, Joseph Bruchak, writer and performer, poet and songwriter, teacher, publisher, and above all, storyteller. Joseph Bruchak uses storytelling in many forms to share his own story and to illuminate the rich history, culture, and heritage of Native peoples. In fact, he's been called the quiet force behind the recognition and proliferation of Native American writing. We'll have a chance to glimpse a few of the many books written by Joseph Bruchak, find out a bit about him while exploring a bit of the history, culture, and beliefs of Native people. Joe, you say in your, your book about storytelling, Tell Me a Tale, that few things have helped you understand the world better than a good story, that stories have helped you grow and grain, gain insight. Why? How have stories helped you achieve this? Well, the thing about a story is that a story is a way both of seeing the world and experiencing the world. When you hear a story, you can find yourself in that story. And that story is the result of the things that people have seen and heard and understood, often for many generations before you. So that knowledge is so condensed and so accessible within a story that you can use it as a way to understand and shape your own life. Well, what sources do you use when you're, you're trying to find stories to, to share? Well, one of the most important things to do is to be a good listener. I found out as a child that if you are quiet when you're around older people, they'll start saying things they might not otherwise say. And in many of our traditional stories, among, for example, both the Iroquois, our neighbors in the Northeast, and my own Abenaki people, often the hero of the story is a child whose name literally means the one who is a good listener. And of course, in addition to listening, I've also, because I've had university education and the opportunity to learn research methods, I also do a lot of reading. Reading has been very important to me throughout my life, and that research and that listening is where my stories really come from. You say that you listen. Where do those stories come from? You're talking about things that have been handed down from generation to generation orally? The oral tradition is still very much alive among American Indian people throughout the continent. And sometimes that oral tradition is in the form of little anecdotes, even jokes. Uh, sometimes it's in the form of very long stories that are told which are traditional. And sometimes people may have part of a story and another person may have another part. And sometimes what I find myself doing because um, quite frankly, these days it's hard for people to find time to storytell as they used to, is putting those pieces together from different places to reshape a story as it would have been told in the time when storytelling was our primary means of communication before we had television and other things that would take our minds and our attention away from those old forms. Well, you create an image of story and storytelling as circular. Could you, you describe that process of storytelling? Well, many years ago, a Mohegan Indian elder named Harold Tantaquidgen gave me this sort of design, and he said, the story is a circle. And the process of learning a story and, in fact, of going through your life is circular. It's a circle with four dots in it. The first stands for the importance of listening. We have two ears, and we're always supposed to listen to two sides of everything. The second dot that we add, that stands for observing, using our two eyes to see that far away and that close to us. The third is memory, because if you don't remember what you've seen and heard, it's as if it never happened. And then, of course, the fourth, which completes the circle, is to share, to listen, to observe, to remember, and to share. Does this have any relevance for the modern listener, for the modern person? Absolutely, because we as human beings always have to do those things. We have to listen, we have to observe. If we don't look at the world around and listen to that world that is around us, we can find ourselves getting into big trouble, as well as not understanding the world that we're in. I've seen people, for example, wearing Walkman sets and walking across the street into traffic, not hearing the car that's coming towards them. You know, we say life is always dangerous. There's always things that could hurt you out there. That's always been true. More so, perhaps, today than ever before. But if you listen, if you observe, your life is going to be both fuller and, quite frankly, more safe. Well, you, you suggested something that I think is kind of interesting. Do you think listeners have changed, or have the stories they listen to changed? 
there's always new stories, but there are also always the old stories. I mean, even in Shakespeare's time, all of Shakespeare's plays were based on old stories that he had heard and observed or had put together in new forms. And we as human beings haven't changed. We're still built the same with two eyes, two ears, and one mouth because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we look and twice as much as we talk. It's just that people have forgotten or have not been exposed to storytelling. But I've observed as I travel around the world that once you start telling a story in any setting, people are interested and start listening. Well, you use traditional stories as well as, as stories from history in your memoir, Bowman's Store. Uh, can you share the story about corn? I thought that was particularly interesting. Well, according to our tradition, there was a time when American Indian people when the native people of the Northeast, my Abenaki people, did not have enough food to eat. And we didn't have corn, although we hunted and fished. That particular plant had not yet come to us. And the story is, and I'll do this in a traditional way, when we tell stories, we want to make sure everybody is awake and listening. So if I say the word ho, I want you to say back hey to me to show me you're awake and listening. Ho? Hey. Ho? Hey. Very wide awake group here. I'd say. This one man who was a very good hunter and a good hearted person was out walking one day in the forest looking for food for his people when he saw a strange thing. A woman was approaching him. She had hair that was yellow, as yellow as the sunlight, and her clothing was as green as the grass. And she spoke to him. She said, I've come to give a gift to your people because you need me. I am going to die. When I die, bury my body here in the earth and watch over my grave, and something good will come to help the people. And indeed, she died. And that man placed her in the earth and covered her grave and kept watch on it. And after time had passed, plants began to grow up. When they were tall enough, at the top of them, they began to form yellow tassels, like the color of her hair. And little ears of corn began to form. That was how corn was given to the people, the gift of the one we call the corn maiden, who sacrificed herself so that we human beings would have a way to continue. You say you picture your grandfather when you, when you share that story or when you think of that story. Is that how you began your journey into yourself? Well, I was raised by my grandparents. And my grandfather, although he was American Indian, would never talk about being Indian. But there were many things that were so Indian about him, one of which was his closeness to the earth. I still plant in the same garden where he grew his crops for more than 50 years. And I picture him with his hands in the earth whenever I see that story or hear that story or tell that story. It's that old bargain between the earth and the people who care for it that we will provide for ourselves and our families and for the future. Native, native traditional stories are, are, are embedded in, in your story, your memoir. But you didn't realize growing up that you were of Abenaki heritage. I grew up at a time when there was a lot of prejudice against American Indian people. And it was, in fact, even a dangerous thing to be American Indian. In the 1920s and 1930s in the state of Vermont, where we have many relatives, they were actually sterilizing people who were American Indian to try to make uh, the future produce better people. They call this process of um, eugenics a good thing in those days. Of course, we realize now it's not a good idea. Uh, so many people who are American Indian hid their heritage in the Northeast and still to this day don't talk a lot about it. But there were things about my grandfather, the way he related to the earth, the fact that he told me as a child he was never struck by his parents. Instead, they would talk to him or tell him a story. And that's traditional child rearing among American Indian people. So that as I grew older and became more aware of this, and all you had to do was look at my grandfather to know he was Indian. Uh, and people would sometimes, even after my grandfather died, come up and say, you may not know this, but your grandfather was an Abenaki <laughs> Indian. And I'd say, I knew that. And they'd say, how'd you know that? And I'd say, I looked at him. So that is part of what my heritage was, finding out my heritage, seeking out the stories that my grandparents might have told me had things been better for Native people in their childhoods. Well, it's interesting because you said that you were raised in, a, in, a, in an Abenaki way, even though you, didn't, you weren't explicitly told that you were, you were of Indian heritage. How else did, did your, father, your grandfather's heritage influence the way he raised you? Well, just being raised by grandparents is very commonly a practice among American Indian people. 
But also, my grandfather was very close to animals. You know, whenever you saw my grandfather around any kind of animal, a dog, a horse, anything, he had a way with them. I remember once when we were at a fair and a horse literally was getting away from someone, might have hurt someone, my grandfather jumped over the fence and calmed that horse down just immediately. You could just talk to an animal. You could tell it was listening to him. And people used to say, Jesse Bowman can make a horse do almost anything. So that relationship between the natural world and being grateful and thankful. He took me to catch my first fish, and I remember him saying thank you to that fish, thanking the fish for giving its life. Well, also stories were a way of, of teaching you. Mm -hmm. Would you share with us the story about checking the peak with your grandfather? <laughs> Well, my grandfather, even in his 80s, loved high places. And we had a house that was like three stories tall. And he had this thing he'd do. He'd put a ladder up against the house, climb up the ladder, and go up there to check the peak. And that means see if the top of the house was still there. I never could quite figure it out, except I think it was one place where he could go, and my grandmother wouldn't ask him to do anything. He'd just be up on top of the house. And I followed him everywhere. I was like his little shadow when I was a year and a half old. I dressed the same way he did tried to talk the way he did, to walk the way he did. And one day, when he went out to check the peak, he forgot I was with him. He got up the top of the house, and he heard a little voice going, ooh, ah. He <laughs> turned around, and there I was at the top of the ladder, holding on with one hand, kind of leaning back and forth. And, you know, another person might have yelled or tried to grab me, but that wasn't my grandfather's way. Instead, he said, oh, forgot my hammer. I guess I better go back down. So I started down the ladder, and he started down with me. And I guess he must have been afraid or something, because he was right over the top of me. And I knew my grandmother had said he was getting on in years, whatever that meant. I thought maybe getting on meant he was getting a little bit scared of heights, you know. So I was patting his hand all the way we were going down the ladder. And he did the strangest thing, because when he got down the bottom, instead of getting that hammer he wanted so bad, he just laid that ladder down on his side and sat like this for a long time, patting his chest and breathing real hard. It's <laughs> fascinating. Would there have been a story that, have, that would have, might have gone along with something like that, behaving um, maybe against explicit wishes or in an unsafe manner? I would learn stories like that later on, not from my grandparents, but from other people. And those stories would remind us that you can't tell someone what not to do because they'll immediately do it. You have to show them or tell them a story that will indicate to them what the danger is of that kind of action. Of course, with a little child, they don't have that comprehension yet, so you also have to be very careful as an adult to watch out for little children. So that story of checking the peak, which my grandfather used to tell me about how I did that. I mean, I don't know if I remember it myself or I remember his memory that he gave to me was a cautionary tale in and of itself. It seems like traditional stories you learned as an adult have really helped you rethink uh, what you felt and experienced as, as a child growing up. Um, how did this, did, did any of this influence your appreciation of the natural world? And how is the natural world related to um, Native beliefs? Well, you know, when I went to college, I was going to become a naturalist. That was my first interest because I had such a long, strong connection with nature. In our Native cultures throughout the continent, wherever you go, people are close to nature, not because they're idealistic or romantic, but because you have to live and you have to treat things properly in order for them to be there for the next generation. So that as I learned more stories from people throughout the years and listened, because listening means people will tell you stories, I began to understand how many of our stories are not just stories, but they're also ways of scientifically, in a symbolic way, explaining our relationship between ourselves and the natural world. So that later on with a naturalist named Michael Caduto, I would write a book called Keepers of the Earth, which uses our traditional stories to teach about natural science and the human relationship to the world that is understood within traditional cultures and is expressed within our stories. Well, some Native stories also explain why things are as they are. And in fact, you wrote a book with your son, Jim, uh, How the Chipmunk Got His Stripes. Um, first of all, can you, can you tell us um, how it was how it was to collaborate with your son, first of all, was that tough or was it? Uh... It wasn't tough at all. Actually, Jim is my older of my two sons, both of whom have worked with me on various projects in the past. And uh, Jim is 32 years old now. 
And he, by the way, is another reason why you should treat your children with respect. <laughs> He's six foot six, that's four inches taller than me and has a third degree black belt. <laughs> and uh, you treat your children well so that when they're bigger and stronger than you, they treat you well too. <laughs> and he grew up hearing stories and being around native people and I never thought he'd become a storyteller. I thought he was going to be a professional athlete, a sports trainer, that's what he said he wanted to do. And then one day, just started telling stories. And when I began putting this book together, How Chipmunk Got His Stripes, I realized that the version that I was telling was influenced by the way Jim was telling it now. So the two of us got together and wrote down a collaborative version of this story, which is a cautionary tale, a story about bragging and teasing, and also explains how, because Chipmunk teased Bear, and Bear scratched Chipmunk's back, those scars turned into the stripes that now all Chipmunks have. Can you just share a little bit of that story? I personally like the bear very much. Well, supposedly in those days, Bear was out walking around and feeling very proud of himself and saying, I, Bear, I can do anything. Ho. Oh? But a little voice said, can you do anything? And Bear looked down and there was a little brown squirrel on the ground. And Bear said, yes, I can do anything. And that little brown squirrel said, can you tell the sun not to come up in the morning? And Bear said, I've never tried that before, but yes, I can do it. Little brown squirrel said, would you do it then? So Bear faced the sun just going down in the sky and said, sun, do not come up tomorrow. The sun vanished from sight and Bear said, you see, the sun is afraid of me. It ran away to hide. And the little brown squirrel said, will the sun come up tomorrow? And Bear said, the sun will not come up. Well, of course, the sun did come up the next day, and that's when Chipmunk began to tease Bear, which was Chipmunk's big mistake. Because as Chipmunk was teasing Bear, all of a sudden a big foot came down on top of Chipmunk, and a voice said, yes, the sun did come up, but you will not live to see another sunrise. At which point, ho, oh, hey. Chipmunk thought fast and said, Bear, you are right to kill me. You are right to eat me. But before you do so, I would like to apologize, but I cannot, I cannot apologize right now because you are pressing down so hard on me. I cannot talk. I cannot even breathe. If you would just lift your foot up, then I could apologize. And Bear said to himself, mm, That is good. I would like to hear an apology before I eat him. Go ahead. And Chipmunk went, Sorry, Pew! and ran for his home among the rocks. And Bear grabbed at Chipmunk and just managed to scratch his back. And Chipmunk got away and curled up in a ball and slept all through the winter. When he came out again, where those claws had scratched him, he now had stripes on his back. That is how that story goes. Ho? Oh? Hey. A very abbreviated telling, a short version of that tale. Well, you, you put your, your mark on that story by the way you tell it. Um, and there's also a particular look that this story has. Um, in its book form. But you and Jim both include notes. Why do you credit sources? What, what purpose does that play? I find that all too often when a story is told from a traditional culture as a picture book for children, there's no sense of where it came from. And I like to acknowledge, the first thing you have to do is get permission to tell a story if it's someone else's story. The second is you have to acknowledge the source and give credit where credit is due. So I'm very strict about that wherever possible. I have done that and I've urged others to do the same. There are even stories out there that are supposedly American Indian stories that aren't, that have been made up and yet people have said it was an American Indian story and they credit no source, give no place you can look further to find out what the story was or how it was told by others. So I always try to do that because I don't want any story even my own personal story, to seem as if I know everything about it. Stories, in a sense, know about themselves. And the people who have told the stories for generations have a special kind of knowledge that we need to remember. Well, you've done a, a really remarkable book called Crazy Horse's Vision, which is based in the story of, of Curly, a boy who was to become known as Crazy Horse. Mm -hmm. What sources did you use to research that story, and how did that, that book achieve what it has? Well, I'm really pleased to have done that story because the story of Crazy Horse is really an American story. He's one of the great American heroes, and 
what happened to him as a child, for me, is inspirational to other people. I began hearing about the story when I was a kid. I read books that talked about the Lakota people. And then as an adult, I traveled out to South Dakota and North Dakota and saw the places where Crazy Horse had lived and met Lakota people who loved to talk about Crazy Horse. Lakota people loved to talk about this man because they say he was brave, he was modest, and he kept nothing for himself. He was one of the most brave of an incredibly brave group of people who really fought for their people and for their land. So when I decided to tell the story of Crazy Horse, I decided to tell the story of his childhood because I think that's a place where we can make a connection most easily. And the story is that as a boy, he witnessed a terrible event, an event in which through a series of misunderstandings and arrogance on the part of the army, a fight took place between the Lakotas and the army and Conquering Bear, a chief who was trying to forge peace, was mortally wounded and died. And that boy, who was called Curly because his hair was curly at the time, and it was common to give kids a nickname, saw this happen. And it made him think, I need to do something to help my people. My people are going to need help in the future. And so he left the camp, went off by himself, and began to fast on a hilltop. And eventually, a vision came to him. And in that vision, he saw a horse. He saw himself as an adult riding on that horse, and no bullet could touch him as long as he kept nothing for himself and only tried to help his people. It's a great story. But you know what's even better about it is that when it was done as a picture book, S.D. Nelson, who was himself Lakota, a descendant of those people, was the artist who was chosen to do the illustrations. And he brought to that story also his own understanding and I asked him to read how I had written the story and to make sure I had told it properly. And he made a couple of suggestions that I used to revise my telling in a few places. So it was a very collaborative book between myself and S.D. Well, I think the, the whole, how often, frankly, many of your books use illustrations. Yes. And how often do you have an opportunity to collaborate with uh, an illustrator um, like S.D. Nelson, who's, who is clearly done this in the 19th century tradition of, of ledger art. Yeah, the ledger book style is fascinating because at one period, American Indian people, the people of the plains, sometimes who were in captivity, were given ledger books, crayons, and pens, and told they could use these to draw pictures. And so they drew these highly angular, um, photographic, unphotographic, I should say, stylistic drawings of events that were of importance to them. For example, the Custer Battle, mm -hmm. which is on the insert leaf of that book. Mm -hmm. Lesty took that style and translated it into a book for kids. Now, in working with S.D., I didn't really have to tell him much of anything. He knew it himself. With other artists, I've sometimes literally been involved in a sort of consult consulting role where I would look at what they had done and not tell them how to envision it, but offer suggestions as to the cultural accuracy of what they depicted because a lot of American Indian books written for young people contain within them distorted, incorrect, and sometimes combined images that put all kinds of different American Indian cultures together. So a book like uh, Brother Eagle, Sister Sky contains within it images that blend a lot of different American Indian cultures when it's supposedly from the speech made by uh, Chief Seattle who lived in the Pacific Northwest. So if anything, I have been really fortunate to work with great illustrators, and my role with them has been more in the line of a consultant and seeing what they're doing and, and having a chance to talk things over with them as the process is going on. Well, you've had an opportunity to study uh, Native art, and could you just talk about how art in Native culture is, is a way of storytelling and what stories it tells? Well, art is storytelling in itself in that when you use something like a natural item, for example, you make a basket of sweet grass, or you carve something out of cedar, or you draw a winter cow on a buffalo robe, that material itself sort of shapes the story and has a way it wants to be told. And storytelling is done through image, it is done through word, and the combination of word and image in a picture book is almost like reading one of those old winter counts, or like reading a ledger book and telling the story that the picture is shaped for you. Well, it's, novels are certainly ways of storytelling. 
and there are very few images in your recent novel, Skeleton Man, but it's one of the scariest books that I've ever read. But it's also one of the most empowering. Um, tell us a little bit about how, how this story came to be uh, and how you decided to embed a traditional tale uh, in this and what traditional tale you embedded. Yeah, I'm, I'm always writing. If you're going to be a writer, you have to write all the time. And even when I'm not writing words on paper, ideas are going through my mind and developing themselves almost without my knowing them. And I think that's what happened with the book Skeleton Man because I had just finished writing a book and I suddenly got an idea. I woke up one morning and I thought, Skeleton Man. And I wrote that on the top of a piece of paper. And then I sat down at my computer and I didn't get up for eight hours. And I worked like that for four days straight and wrote the entire book in four days. Although I went back and revised it a great deal and did much more work on it, that really told itself to me, that particular story. And I was interested in, in two things. One, within our American Indian cultures, women play a very strong role. In fact, women are expected to be brave and self-reliant. Unlike fairy tale heroines in Europe where they're waiting for some handsome prince to come and rescue them, American Indian women often rescue themselves and the boys to boot. <laughs> uh, secondly, the way traditional monster stories work, because a monster story is both a cautionary tale and a tale that can empower you, because in our traditions, if you behave incorrectly, the monsters may get you. But if you behave properly, if you listen, if you observe, if you learn the right lessons, even a small child can defeat a terrible monster. And what was the monster in Skeleton Man? The Skeleton Man story is an old story, I think it's very old, told among both the Iroquois and the Abenaki. And the gist of the story is that there is a man who is very lazy, a lazy uncle. And while the parents are out gathering food or hunting and the children are out of the lodge, he just sits there waiting to be fed. And one day he notices after he's cleaned out the cooking pot, there's a little something left in the fire that looks like food. So he reaches for it to try to get it, ah, and he burns himself badly. And, sticks his finger in his mouth and goes, mmm, mmm, this is very good, mmm, mmm, mmm. And he eats all the flesh off his finger so that nothing is left but bone. And he goes, I have found an easy way to get food. And then he cooks another finger and eats it and another one and another one. Then he cooks his hand and his other hand and his arm and his legs. He cooks his whole body and eats himself so that all is left is a hungry skeleton. And then this hungry skeleton begins to eat other people. And the skeleton is eventually defeated in the long run by the children who know what to do and who are even able to save their parents when it seems as if all hope is gone. So that, that empowerment of the child defeating the monster, of the child saving the parents, also is a part of the novel Skeleton Man, which takes place in contemporary times with an American Indian young woman named Molly as the heroine. And she's remembering both the stories her father told her and she's being guided by dreams, which tell her what she needs to do. Well, dreams are very important. You, you mentioned dreams that you had in Bowman's store. Crazy Horse has a vision, which I, I assume is, is like a dream. And, and Molly's dream recurs to her, which ultimately helps her along her path. Um, talk a little bit more about dreams in the native in native beliefs. Well, throughout the continent, uh, from the far north to uh, the depths of the Mexican jungles, native people will tell you to listen to your dreams, because dreams contain messages. They contain wishes from your heart. Sometimes, if you don't listen to your dreams, you may not just get into trouble. You may get physically ill. Actually, this is beginning to sound a little bit like Freudian and Jungian psychology, yeah. and. Uh, for, for me, a dream, whatever is the source of the dream, I don't really care because it works. When I listen to my dreams, I'll wake up in the morning with an idea from a dream and start writing. I've heard entire songs sung to me in a dream and gotten up and grabbed my guitar or my flute before I could forget it and began trying to record them with a tape recorder. Perhaps it's just that because you've done something for so long, your mind continues to work while you're asleep and it solves problems that your waking life can't solve. Or maybe it is that there are things beyond us, like the voice of the muse that the Greeks spoke about. 
that will speak to us from outside us and in our dreams we're open to that voice. Whichever the case may be, dreams have always played a very great part in my life and my writing and I like to put both traditional stories and dreams and sometimes the dream within the traditional story into the things that I write. I think it strengthens and broadens the appeal and the message of the work. You uh, had indicated that um, uh, dreams helped, uh, helped guide you. What, do they play a larger role in Native, in native traditions? Uh, and you mentioned something about listening to your heart. What else symbolizes? Uh, well, if you look at the drum, mm. the drum itself is like the heart. In fact, the mm -hmm. sound of the drum is the sound of the heartbeat. That double beat, which is the first sound we hear even before you're born, you hear the sound of the drum, the sound of your mother's heart beating. And the dream itself and dreams themselves are important guides within American Indian cultures. Still to this day, there are traditions, for example, that existed long ago among the Iroquois, where once a year they would have something called dream guessing, where everybody would get together and try to guess the dreams they had had and then try to act out those dreams to symbolically enact them in life so that the thing in the dream can be made real and also can be made in a way that will not harm or confuse you. So it was often a way of expressing those things you couldn't express publicly, but through a dream or through a story, you can communicate those important lessons. Fascinating. Would you share something on the drum? To yeah, this how, is how might a drum be used in storytelling, for example? Well, drums could be used to call people together. Mm -hmm. Drums could be used as a part of a story. A song might be sung. Or in this case, I'm going to share a song that is a very old Abenaki song. I'll do just a short version of it. It's called Little Pines or Tutuage. And the little pines are like the children. The big pine trees protect the little trees growing beneath their branches. So too, Young people are protected by their elders, and one day, like the little pines, they may grow up to be taller. Dum jum sat mu sej tu tu aj. 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 Que hai one neo, que hai one neo, que hai one neo, que hai one neo. That's lovely. Would you share one more story with us? A story that you think is important for us in our contemporary times to know. When we tell stories, we always want to remind people our connection between ourselves and the natural world. Ho! Hey. And there is a story that uh, my sons like to tell about the drum. They say there was a time when we had no drum, when the drum was not part of our lives. And at that time, people knew things, but each family knew different things. Some families knew medicine, some families knew how to hunt, some families knew how to make things, but people were not sharing those things with each other. And as a result, the people were suffering. Well, that was when Gluskonba, or Gluskabe, the one the Creator made to make this earth a better place for human beings, saw what had happened. He realized the people needed to be brought together. And so Gluskonba made the first drum and began to play it. And the people came from their separate homes, from their separate wigwams, and they began to dance because their feet were telling them to dance, because their hearts knew the rhythm of the drum. They joined together in a circle and joined hands in the first friendship dance. And then Gluskomba said, This drum I give you, it is called Paco Ligan. Paco means the heart. Ligan means to make. It will make the sound of the heartbeat and it will draw you together. And when you hear this drum beat, you will come together and share and you will all grow stronger from being part of the circle that the drum connects us to. Ho! And that's a story from long ago. What else do you, you, you we had talked earlier about um, drums and, and how they connect to heartbeats and, and things, things kind of say what they are um, in Native tradition and culture. 
it's true of the drum. It says what it is. You can hear the, the heartbeat in it. Um, in the flute, you can hear uh, the wind and I suppose, you know. The birds, yes. Yeah, the flute is called Pekongan. Pekongan. And it reminds us that the sound of the flute has within it that message from the birds and the wind. In fact, we say if you look at the flute, the holes in the flute remind us of the woodpecker, who was the bird that first made holes in a hollow branch of a tree. And when the wind blew across that tree, creating the first music, we say that someone saw this and realized this was a gift from the birds and from the wind and took that branch of the tree. I mean, to this day, this part of the flute is called the branch of the flute, and it's made from the branch of a cedar tree. So that if you listen to our languages, if you hear our stories, you'll often find that things explain what they are. They say their own names. I mean, for example, in Abenaki, the word for crow is ga ga. That's the one who makes that sound. Or the word for seagull is ka'ak. And there indeed is the sound of the animal or the bird in its own words. And uh, even, uh, <laughs> even when we had to make up new words, for example, when Europeans came, they brought with them things called watches, by which people told what they called time. Now to us, time was just sunrise, sunset, day and night, the progression of the sun, the progression of the moon, the change of the seasons. But they divided it up into all these little divisions that we didn't understand. And so we had to make up a name for a watch. So uh, probably about 300 years ago, a name was made up for the watch in Abenaki, which is Papelkwizel uh, Tozik. Papelkwizel Tozik, kind of as the sound of a watch, doesn't it? Sure does. But Papelkwizel Tozik literally means that thing which makes much noise, but does nothing that's really useful. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, I have many more questions, but I think it's time that we ask our studio audience if, if they have questions. Thinking of time. Yeah. Who's first? Okay. Have, you ever <coughs> have you ever related any of your personal stories on actions of your family or friends? I like to say that stories always come to us from many different directions. Everybody has stories. You have stories of your ancestry, stories of your family, uh, stories of the place where you live and stories of your own personal experience. And indeed, I tell stories from all four of those directions. And sometimes something will happen to me or to my family, and one or the other of us will end up using it as a story and telling it to someone else. Do you have an overall favorite book that you've, that you've written so far? I always tell people my favorite book is the one I haven't finished writing yet. And if I've published a book, to me it's like one of my kids. I wouldn't dare say which children I like best. <laughs> you have to be fair. Uh, you know, and books are like kids because once they're published, they're out there on their own. And you as the author can't do anything to help it. It has to be between that book and the people who read it. When writing about your culture, do you tend to embellish about some things? I think embellishment is a word that wouldn't be my choice, but I do know everybody uses their own way of describing things, so I could tell a story at greater or lesser length, but I try not to distort or to say things incorrectly. I try instead to, uh, to tell the story in the way it could be understood most clearly. So if I'm telling it to very young people, I might tell a much simpler version than I would to people who are sophisticated seventh graders. In addition to our studio audience, we have uh, a, a, an audience around the country, and we'd like to invite you to call in uh, questions to Joseph Bruchak. The number is 1-800-578-1396. And we'll continue with our studio audience questions. Um, what do your other family members do for a living? What do my other family members do for a living? Well, it's kind of interesting because my uh, son, Jim, is now a professional storyteller and he also teaches traditional native outdoor skills. My son Jesse designs websites but also has been a teacher of the Abenaki language. And one of my sisters, Marge, my uh, younger sister, is getting her doctorate in anthropology and is a storyteller and teaches and, and helps people understand about the native histories and cultures of New England. So you could say a lot of our family is involved in doing very interrelated things. We now have a question uh, from Newport News. Caller, go ahead. Hello, my name is Tammy Cook, and I am Chalagee Cherokee. That is my tribe. I write children's stories, a lot having to do with the stories that were told to me 
as a young girl. And I would appreciate any direction as to how to have my books hopefully one day published. Ocio, good to meet you over the phone. Uh, one thing I would suggest you do is look up on the internet a group called WordCraft Circle, wordcraft.org. WordCraft Circle is an organization designed to help other native writers and storytellers find a place to share their work. And there are also organizations like the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators that help you make contacts and learn about publishing. But more than anything else, I would urge you to keep listening to your elders and keep writing the stories down. Because if you don't do it now, every time an elder passes, it's like we're losing a library. And there may be family stories and personal stories that only you have connections to and that only you can write down. And I say this to everyone interested in writing. Remember, your voice can be very significant. We have another question. In what way does your writing affect the readers of Native, Native American descent in contrast to those of other readers? I like to think I write first and foremost for human beings, which is all people who read. But I do know that I've heard from Native kids and, and Native adults around the country that the stories I've told are sometimes so much like the stories of their own life that it's given them inspiration or that it's made them feel a sense of pride and connection when other things have made them feel as if American Indian people were being badly treated or incorrectly portrayed. They like the accuracy and the humanity that I find in my characters and in the stories I write. So I've gotten some really, I think, very inspiring messages from Native kids and Native readers that have led me to want to do even more in that respect. We have a call now from Central Virginia. Caller? Hello. Uh, how are you? You have a wonderful program. Um, coming from South America, I'm very interested in the Native American cultures. Uh, one thing that caught my attention also was uh, I saw a movie uh, from uh, the lab people in Norway called The Pathfinder. And I was thinking that there was a lot of similarities in their rights and uh, animal symbolism, etc., with the Native Americans. I was wondering if you had uh, um, found any similarities between those cultures, like N Native Americans with lap, lap people. Yeah, the, the Sami people, who used to be called the laps of the Arctic regions of um, the Scandinavian countries, although they're blonde and blue-eyed people, um, reindeer herders very close to the earth and their traditions are very similar to American Indian traditions and I've had the good fortune of hearing some Sami storytellers, hearing some of their music and, and sharing some things with them and to me what it teaches me is that all people who remain close to the earth, who remain close to the, the rhythms of nature will have a lot in common even though we are very different from each other which makes it interesting still there are many things that we share whether we're talking about Native European people, Native American people, Native African, Native Asian people. There are so many things that as human beings we all share. It occurs to me though, Joseph, that, that th there may be a difficulty in tracking down the authenticity of a source. I, you know, you talk about the commonalities and, and the dissimilarities, and you've alluded to some, some other writing that, that's available that isn't very authentic, how would, would anyone who's not deeply familiar with a culture determine whether it's authentic or not? I think we need to listen to the people from the culture who themselves are so embedded in it and have had so much experience in it. Not every person automatically will know everything about their own culture, but there are many people out there, for example, who are Lakotas, who will tell you what is a real Lakota story and what is not, or who are Chalagi or Aniunwi, a Cherokee and will tell you what is a legitimate and true story and what is not. So turn to those people and look to primary sources. Unfortunately, these days, we have a lot of secondary and tertiary information, and even further removed from the original on the Internet, is full of inaccuracies and mistakes. So don't look at that as the be-all and end-all, but look to the primary sources, look to the original people, and listen to them. Just listen to them. The circle continues. Yes. We now have a call from Gaithersburg, Maryland. Caller, go ahead. Hi, my name is Mary, and I want to find out how to go about picking out a personal drum for a drumming circle. 
Well, I always, when I have drums, I usually get them that are given to me. This one was made by a friend of mine named Nana Tassis, who's an Abenaki medicine person and a very wonderful woman. But if you're going to buy a drum, play the drum and listen to it. Let the drum speak to you. And even more than that, if you know someone who is a drum maker and you're not just dealing with a commercial drum, there's a personal connection. Whenever I get something that is an article of, of what you might call jewelry or regalia or a flute or a drum, I always like to know who I'm getting it from and to have a, a little bit of a relationship between myself and that person. I think that's especially true for musical instruments that are traditional ones. Okay. Um, when you get writer's block, what do you do to get back on track when you're writing? I just don't get writer's block. Because I think writer's block is something we talk ourselves into. We think we're not worthy, <laughs> or we think what we have to say isn't worth it. Whenever I feel like I'm at an impasse, I just start writing. I sit down and start writing anything that comes into my head, and eventually it begins to flow into what I need. Because the great thing about writing, as my Slovak grandfather used to say, is it's always better to cut a board too long, because you can shorten it. Write as much as you can, because you can always revise and cut out the parts you don't need. So don't let writer's block stop you. It's just something you're putting yourself through that you don't really need. Do you, rec do you recommend that young people keep a journal, maybe? As I've, a I've always loved keeping journals, because if you get in the practice of writing and writing things down, this is not a diary. A diary is just for you. A journal is for public, eventually public consumption. So get in the practice of writing, keep writing, and share what you write. If your Indian ancestors could see the modern technology of today, what story do you think they would come up with for it? We're always coming up with new stories. Whenever you see something, there's always a story connected to it. For example, we had never seen a ferry before, you know, a boat crossing the water. But when someone saw a ferry for the first time, they gave it a name, which is the same name in Abenaki for froth, little bubbles that go across the top of the water. So new things are very easily accepted within American Indian cultures. It doesn't mean that we have been changed. It just means we've found a way to fit it in. So that I have a friend who's a Mohawk steel worker. And the Mohawk people wear a traditional hat that has a revolving feather on top of it. So he has his steel worker's helmet, and he's painted a feather on it. <laughs> so he's brought both the old and the new together. We now have a call from Kennebunkport, Maine. Call yes, us. hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, we're here. How you doing? Uh, I just have a question about um, how the um, how the Indians and how the uh, Indians pride how it all began and, and how it all started. Because uh, I don't know much. Because I'm from Kennebunk, Maine, and I just don't know like how it all started. And, and I wasn't maybe maybe you could sh um, tell me how it all began. In Abenaki traditions, as far as um, this world is concerned. The world is shaped by the thought of the creator, Ktsinawask, the great mystery. And it's beyond our comprehension. But we do say that the first person to walk on the world was one we call Gluskonba, and he's actually called Gluskap or uh, Gluskabe there in Maine, and that he shaped himself from the dust that fell from the hands of the creator. But uh, the earth itself and its creation, there are many different stories told about it in all our different native cultures, and some of them seem to correspond in a very symbolic way with the actual forces that are described as the geological genesis of the Earth. In fact, the image of the Earth being placed on the back of a giant turtle is common in many of our different native cultures. And we know now with plate tectonic theory that the crust of the Earth floats on the back of movable plates that move beneath the Earth and cause things like volcanoes and earthquakes. In South America, the Mayan people say when there's a volcanic eruption or there's an earthquake, the turtle beneath the earth is moving around. So symbolically, it ties right in with modern scientific theory. Interesting. Are you interested in any other type of cultures other than your own? I'm interested in human beings in general. I've had the good fortune to live for three years in West Africa, and I learned a great deal about Ghanaian cultures at that point. I've traveled in Europe and other parts of the world, and everywhere I go, people are always telling me stories. It's just that in my own writing and in my own storytelling, I like to focus on those things that are closest to me and come most from me. But that's not all that I know or all that I'm interested in. I really have a very wide range of interests, as I think we all should.
and a focus that's very clear on what I do for my work. What, what advice do you give to young writers about writing about their country that they came from, religion? Uh, listen to your elders. Uh, don't get discouraged. Don't accept those things that seem to be negative, which others have sometimes said, because often that's the result of someone outside the culture looking at it incorrectly. Listen to your heart. And above all, don't give up. Remember, one word of praise is worth a lot. Usually people take one word of criticism and they say, oh, that's awful, I can't do it. Don't listen to the criticism as much as you listen to those things that help you grow. Are you happy with the difficult books that you've written? Uh, I'm very happy with what I've written, but I'm not satisfied because I think there's always more to do. And each book I write is, when it's done, I let go of it. I don't dwell on it or worry about the reviews of it. I just say it's out there. But I also think that as a writer, any writer will tell you, they always feel like they could do better. They're always trying to do better. Is there a single influence on your writing that takes precedent over anything else? What? Why did you choose writing as a medium to reach more people, to, to uh, share bro more broadly your experiences, your beliefs? I think that in a way writing chose me because I learned a long time ago that every person is given certain gifts by the Creator. And one of the best things that could happen to someone is to recognize what their gift is and then to, to work with it, as Joseph Campbell calls it, finding your bliss. And for me, I'm good at writing, I'm good at storytelling, and you know, thank the Creator, I've been able to do it as my profession, and there are people who are willing to listen to me and read what I've written. But I think that it was something that was decided for me by whatever gifts I was given and by the circumstances of my life. When, were you, when, when did you discover this about yourself? Or when was this revealed to you? Probably writing in second grade. That's when I started writing poems for my teachers and sharing my writing. Storytelling when I had my own children, because I, stole, I told stories to them, and those stories I told to them later became the genesis of my first books were written for children. Interesting. We now have a call from Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Caller, go ahead. Yes, I just had a question. Um, what kind of Indian books do you, do you like um, writing, and how many more are you going to write? Um, I'm going to keep writing until I can't write any longer, as a friend of mine once said, until they pry my cold fingers from the keyboard. <laughs> but as far as what kind of books I like, uh, I would suggest that you look to books written by Native writers first if you want to read books about American Indians. And there are so many good American Indian writers out there right now, I can't name them all. There's just dozens or hundreds of people who are doing significant work. Uh, a few people I could mention would be Chantal Begay, who is a Navajo writer writing for children, Gail Ross, a Cherokee storyteller who is writing for children, and those are just, just two people to start what would be a very long list. Interesting. Are there, is there one caution or one word of advice that you would give to uh, our, our audience about writing or researching what they write? As I was saying before, the important thing about writing is to make writing a regular part of your life. And when you're doing research, go to primary sources, listen to elders, but also listen to your own heart. Make sure you're doing what you want to do, you're doing it from your heart, and not just from your head. As, as, you've, uh, as you've alluded to, there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, possibility out here in terms of what we listen to and how we then share it. In fact, as you've suggested, there is a traditional Native uh, belief about gift giving, and we give our gifts um, as, as they're given to us, and that the key to a happy life is giving of those gifts freely. Um, we thank you for sharing your gift of listening, observing. Uh, what's the third 
I'm sorry, I've just lost it. I've, Listen, observe, remember. Remember, yeah, which is what I forgot. <laughs> and sharing. We appreciate your, your sharing with us. That makes you an extraordinary writer and storyteller. You know, in American Indian tradition, we don't have a word for goodbye in any of our languages that I know of. But we do say that life is like a circle. See, we're always going around that circle, so we may encounter each other again. Therefore, instead of saying goodbye, we say, have a good journey, travel well. And these days, I think that's more important than ever to say that to people. Wulipamkuni nidobak, travel safely, travel I'd like well. to thank you and thank the students in the studio for being with us. Also, a special thanks to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program. It's been my pleasure to share with you the extraordinary writings and talents of Joseph, Joseph Bruchak. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question today, you can contact the performer by going to the website address on the screen and asking additional questions for two weeks. That website is artsedge.kennedy-center.org slash pwtv. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions. There you'll also find additional information on Joseph Bruchak, his books, and classroom activities that integrate the arts into the curriculum. You'll also find information on our upcoming programs. We'd like to hear what you think of the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series. So we've also provided an electronic evaluation form. It's on the Prince William Network uh, website at www.pwnet.org. And we ask that you fill it out so we can select topics and resources you need to enhance your classroom experience. Our next live performance will be Thursday, December 6 at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time when Dr. Billy Taylor and Estella Olevsky will perform and demonstrate the similarities and differences between jazz and classical music. As we go to the credits, you'll hear The Way, written by Joe and performed by Joe and his son Jesse Bruchak. They're both members of the Dawnland Singers, a family group whose work represents the strength of living Native people through stories and song. Thank you for being with us today. You greet the dawn To know the day You speak one word To start to pray The breath of life Is in the wind Each day we start We start again Take